Assalamu alaikum guys, welcome to one of the most important videos that I feel I've ever done. Douche! <laughs> we got two types of generations here, yeah? We got the 9 11 generation, like myself, maybe you were in secondary school when that tragedy happened, and ever since then, you feel you and your religion have been on a back foot or you got the other generation which is carrying the burden of ISIS. MashaAllah we've got loads of academics that give brilliant answers on this but the videos are like one and a, one and a half hours sitting there with their flipping trousers coming up to hair and flipping uh, long plaited nasal hair. I uh, ain't got time for that mate, you know what I'm saying? Or there's like brilliant publications but literally it's like the whole thing is written in binary mate. You got statistics coming out your armpits, you, it's all over the place. I guess what I'm trying to say in a roundabout sort of way is we got answers to this, but unfortunately because it's not accessible it puts a lot of non-Muslims off the religion. But I am gonna tell you some stuff guys, I am gonna tell you and I tell you by the end of this video your perspective will have changed. We're speeding up training of ISIL forces including volunteers from Sunni tribes. You can call it a slip of the tongue or a Freudian slip. Either way, Obama's onto something. Why is it that only Muslim nations have problems? Nowadays we see this accusation being thrown around a lot. All right, cool. Short answer, because if you look geographically, we're the ones with the oil. Lord Crew. I don't know why I did that when I said crew, yeah, it's just subliminal. So <laughs> Lord Crew said in the 1920s and the Foreign Office in 1958 that the aim was to keep Arabia divided so no one unified power could challenge Western interests. How long would you stay in Iraq for? Forever? I would stay as long as American interests are served by being in Iraq. I don't know how long that would be, but that's not the question. The question what about Iraqi now, interests? That's not the question. I'm, I am a servant of the American government, so my perspective is going to be what is in America's interests. You asked a question about how long America would <laughs> I stay. I asked a question about another country and you said American interests. I'm wondering about yeah. Iraqi interests. If well, they don't want American troops well, there, of course. who cares about American interests? Well, no, right? of course. You believe in democracy? If you go and you try to keep a country divided, eventually the people find out and it causes a rebellion. Foreign interference always has and always will lead to some sort of violent rebellion. In the 1900s, Crispin Black, a former cabinet office intelligence analyst as well as special branch officer have confirmed that here in London, London, why London? The government was giving refuge to extremist groups. I don't think you heard what I said, yeah? The government knew these groups existed and they deliberately gave them refuge. And the government's only condition was, look, whatever you're doing, you're doing, but don't do anything over here and don't interfere with what we're doing. Why? Well, there were a few advantages to this because whatever was happening was happening in their own backyard. They could keep an eye on it and it would give them leverage over certain foreign affairs. But we know after 9-11 the US and its allies went to Iraq and that's where it all fell apart. But I think by and large uh, there is nothing to apologize for. Nothing to apologize for. So when the US invaded Iraq in 2003 in defiance of international law, no WMDs found, no Al-Qaeda connections, terror threat to the US increased, thousands of people tortured, hundreds of thousands killed, millions displaced from their homes, Iran's influence increased in the region, ISIL born in Iraq, several trillion dollars burned through in the process. You don't think that requires any kind of, you know what, we got some things wrong? Well we certainly did get some things wrong, but that's what happens. What? The groups that were living amicably in this country then became 
cheesed off. And then suddenly that narrative that was okay once upon a time. It's okay to use Al Qaeda when they're fighting the Russians. Nice, cool. We had this brilliant idea that we were going to come to Pakistan and create a force of Mujahideen, equip them with Stinger missiles and everything else to go after the Soviets inside Afghanistan. We know of their deep belief in God and we are confident that their struggle will succeed. Because your fight will prevail and you'll have your homes and your mosques back again because your cause is right and God is on your side. The people we are fighting today, we funded 20 years ago. It doesn't matter about them abusing rights here and there or what version of Islam they follow, that doesn't matter. It's only when they become an enemy over you, then it becomes a problem. For all these decades since, we have been using Wahhabism uh, in its radicalized form in order to pursue Western interests. Uh, against the Ba'athists, against the Nasserists, um, against the Soviet Union, influence in the Middle East and against Iran and Syria uh, uh, since. So we've had this deep ambivalence in Western policy where we're both in bed with terrorists and fighting them at the same time in many cases. We don't say that very often so publicly. But even then, before going into war, MI5 warned the Prime Minister about the consequences of what would happen in the country. Prior to the war your, your view was that a war in Iraq would aggravate the threat from whatever source yeah. to the United Kingdom. How did you communicate this view to the Prime Minister? I, it was communicated through the Drake assessments. Yeah, naturally there's going to be a backlash. You're harboring these groups for God's sake. You've allowed it. And it was this war that experts as well as Obama himself admitted Brace yourself. actually created, yes listen to what I'm saying, created ISIS. There undeniably would be no ISIS if we had not invaded Iraq. ISIL is a direct outgrowth of Al Qaeda in Iraq that grew out of our invasion which is an example of unintended consequence. There's no mention of scripture, no mention of religion, no mention of reformation and all of that business. Islam is the threat this country faces. And the way the war was handled further angered the people that were there, forcing them to side with these unbalanced extreme groups. And you mentioned standards, you didn't mention Camp Nama in Iraq yeah. uh, which was nicknamed nasty ass military area and where according to a New York Times investigation US interrogators beat prisoners with rifle butts, spat in their faces and used them for target practice in a game of paintball where the motto was no blood no foul meaning interrogators couldn't be prosecuted if they visibly, if a detainee didn't visibly bleed. And number two the drone strikes, for example, many have argued they create more terrorists than they kill. The night raids in Afghanistan, I, I many have argued yeah, they I, create more terrorists I, I than, they, than they get. I don't disagree with that. I, I think that that's, in, that's conflict. What? And then you had mercenaries that were working there that are not prone to the same scrutiny and same consequences that regular army officers are. Because you yourself have referred to the people your men were fighting in Iraq as barbarians who crawled out of the sewer. You say in your memoir, these were the chanting barbarians American troops had been sent to liberate? Sure. If you, if, if people that think it's okay to drive a car bomb into the middle of a square, into the middle of a marketplace, while to attempt to kill an American and in, 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 in doing so they kill dozens and dozens of civilians, absolutely that's barbaric. Which is true, I think if you refer to terrorists you call them whatever you want, but you said these were the chanting barbarians American troops had been sent to liberate. You weren't sent to liberate terrorists. Sounds like you're talking about Iraqis. Sir, uh, look, the, 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 from the, your the, words from your memory. The, the decision, the decision of Iraq. And number three, to create conditions to help terrorists network. Camp Buka. That's the name of the post war US detention facility in southern Iraq, in which around 100,000 Iraqi men were held. Again, many of them were completely innocent. Well, camp Buka and other military facilities ended up being luxury radicalization centers. It then became a management seminar 
for upper echelons of ISIS. One former Buka detainee was none other than Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. You might have heard of him. He's the founder of ISIS. According to Iraqi terrorism expert Hisham al-Hashimi, the loathsome Baghdadi got more radicalized while in US detention, where he, quote, absorbed the jihadist ideology and established himself. Thanks, Kambuka. But I know what you're thinking, yeah? Surely, when ISIS was born, immediately the first and foremost priority would be to quash it. And we know that this was, this was growing. We were watching. We saw that, that Daesh was growing in strength. We were watching. We saw that, that Daesh was growing in strength. If that's not all, ISIS's growth was actually encouraged. And we thought Assad was right. Uh, we thought, however, we could probably manage, uh, you know, that Assad might then negotiate. What? And a secret analysis by the agency you ran, the Defense Intelligence Agency, in August 2012 said, and I quote, that, quote, is there is a possibility of establishing a declared or undeclared Salafist principality in eastern Syria, and this is exactly what the supporting powers to the opposition want in order to isolate the Syrian regime. The U.S. saw the ISIL caliphate coming and did nothing. That the US and the UK, amongst other countries there, have supported ISIS yeah, in terms of weapons, in terms of uh, money, in terms of training, indirectly and possibly directly. These guys have been funding uh, groups there to fight ISIS. Yeah. So what happens is they drop 3,000 tons because the group that they give it to are too weak. Naturally, they sunk, succumb to the power of ISIS. Lo and behold, who ends up with the weapons? ISIS. Yeah. And then you got propaganda. Setting up all these social media pages for your groups, but these groups end up joining ISIS. So what you've done is you just promoted ISIS. Training. Yeah. Literally billions. Operation Timber Sycamore. Billion pound project. Yeah. To arm and train Syrian rebels. And lo and behold, the weapons ended up going to opposition groups anyway. And this was reported by Alternate Media in March 2017. It was a question that in my 30 years experience of, uh, of working with these groups, actually on both ways, on both sides um, of radical groups and having been involved with them. What? Nearly always standing behind radical groups has been a state actor or an intelligence service of a state actor. They are not just entirely something that has spontaneously arisen. You know what the embarrassing thing is? Because people don't know about what's going on, the foreign policy, the decisions and choices that have been made, these sorts of facts get ignored and then these people have the audacity to come to us and say, I I ISIS, what have you got to say about it? What do you mean, what have I got to say about it? I've got nothing to do with it, just like you don't. ISIL is a direct outgrowth of Al-Qaeda in Iraq that grew out of our invasion, which is an example of unintended consequence. You're waking the neighbors! No, shut up! So don't let somebody come and put a finger in your face and tell you you're a terrorist, it's your religion, it's this. No, I'm sorry, that just doesn't work anymore. I'm going to leave it there until next time. <sighs> This is a memo that describes how we're going to take out seven countries in five years, starting with Iraq and then Syria, Lebanon, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, and finishing off Iran. Assalamu alaikum.